On the evening of May 7, 1937, the Hindenburg exploded, causing the deaths of 35 people, 13 passengers and 22 crewmen, of the 97 people on board. This disaster was the first to be recorded by newsreel coverage and was paired with the voice provided by Herbert Morrison to give the illusion of a live broadcast. In this episode of Historyisms, we will be covering the history of Zeppelins, the events leading up to the disaster, and the theories surrounding this tragedy. It began at the turn of the century. Civil War veteran and aeronautics expert Fredrund von Zeppelin had spent the latter half of the 19th century trying to convince the German government to see the militaristic value and usefulness of his rigid airship design. After he resigned from the army in 1891, he devoted all his time and energy into this project. The first hurdle he encountered was in fact air itself. He found that his design, a metal frame wrapped in a fabric envelope, could not overcome the amount of air resistance required for flight. Another problem he encountered was that the engines he was using were too heavy, so he called upon Rudolf Sigsfield to construct a lighter and more powerful engine. Despite these setbacks, construction on Zeppelin's Zeppelin commenced in early 1896. On July 2, 1900, after four years of work, the inaugural flight of the LZ-1 began. It flew for approximately 20 minutes and was damaged when landing. After the LZ-1, the LZ-2 through 5 were built with varying degrees of success, with the LZ-5 actually making it into the German military in 1910. As the First World War began, Zeppelins were extensively used in bombing campaigns by both the German and the British. After the war, the Zeppelin industry really hit its stride, with the first transatlantic flight taking place on October 12, 1924, and by 1930, regular trips from Frankfurt to Rio de Janeiro were taking place. The Hindenburg was actually part of the Hindenburg class of airships. At the time, the Hindenburg class was the largest and most elegant Zeppelins in the air, and was named after Paul von Hindenburg. The Hindenburg specifically was designed and built in 1931, but was promptly stopped when the company building it, Luftschiffbau Zeppelin, went bankrupt. It wasn't until 1933 when the designer of the airship, Hugo Eckner, made a deal with the Nazis. In return for their help, he was forced to display a swastika on the Finns. Construction resumed in 1935. The Hindenburg made her maiden flight on March 4, 1936, and was first used as a tool for Nazi propaganda before being repurposed by the end of March as a passenger liner. In the 1936 flying season, the airship made seven round trips to Rio de Janeiro and ten round trips to New York City, covering more than 190,000 miles or more than 308,000 kilometers. The 1937 flying season started out optimistically, with the successful round trip to Rio de Janeiro landing in Frankfurt, Germany in late March. After departing from Frankfurt, Germany on the evening of May 3, 1937, the Hindenburg made its way to Lakehurst, New Jersey. This was to be the first in a series of 10 trips from Europe to the USA in the 1937 flying season. It was planned that after landing in Lakehurst, the Hindenburg was to travel to Newark, New Jersey, then back to Frankfurt. The trip from Frankfurt to Lakehurst was only carrying half capacity, but the return trip to Frankfurt was completely booked, most likely for the fact that the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth in England was scheduled to take place on May 12. By the time the ship was in Boston on the morning of the 6th, it was already hours behind schedule, thanks in no part to the strong headwinds as the Hindenburg traveled across the Atlantic. There were also talks of more delays because thunderstorms in Lakehurst that afternoon. Being advised of these conditions, Captain Max Press altered the course to the have the ship sail over Manhattan Island. By 4 p.m., the ship has passed the spot in which they were supposed to land. As to buy more time and let the storm pass, Captain Press took the passengers on an impromptu tour of the New Jersey seaside. After finally receiving word that the storms had passed at 6.22 p.m., the ship made its way back to Lakehurst. At this point, the Hindenburg was half a day late. As a result of this, the public, hoping to get a tour of the ship, were told that they could not visit the mooring location or tour the Hindenburg while it was at port. Around 7 p.m., the Hindenburg made its final approach to the Lakehurst Naval Air Station. It was agreed upon to do what is called a flying moor, which involves the airship dropping landing ropes at a high altitude, generally between 400 and 250 feet, then winched down to the mooring mast. Now this type of landing was relatively common in American Zeppelins, but the Hindenburg had only done this a handful of times in Lakehurst in 1936. 
At 7.09 p.m., the ship made a sharp left turn around the landing field because the ground crew was not ready. At 7.11, the Hindenburg turned back toward the field, and by 7.14, the captain ordered all engines to idle, and the ship slowed. At 7.21 p.m., the airship was at an altitude of 295 feet, and Captain Press ordered the landing ropes to be dropped. All was going according to plan at 7.25 p.m. Then, the unthinkable happened. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's right, and it's rising. It's rising terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's like 20... Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the passengers speeding around it. I don't do I can't even talk to people. There's friends around there. It's a, it's, a, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it's just laying there, mass of smoking wreckage. And everybody can't hardly breathe and talk and scream and lady. I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. I, I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Immediately following the crash, a number of theories were proposed on how this could have happened. The most prominent theory was that it was an act of sabotage. Hugo Eckner, designer of the airship, even said that someone could have shot a gun causing the explosion, but also didn't rule out other less nefarious causes. Another person who believed that the Hindenburg was sabotaged was Captain Max Pruss. In an interview in 1960, he said that during trips to South America in 1936, the airship passed through many thunderstorms and was even struck by lightning, but remained intact and unharmed. Most of the crew, including the captain, claimed that there was only one person who they all believed could have sabotaged the airship. His name was Joseph Spa. He was a German acrobat and contortionist. For the past six months, Spa had traveled all over Europe, and while on his travels, he had acquired a German shepherd he named Ola. Now with the European tour over, he planned to give the dog to his children. He was traveling to New York City for a performance at Radio City. The dog was kept in a freight room near the back of the ship, and, according to crew members, Spa made several prohibited unaccompanied trips to feed Ola. The crew members allege that any one of these unaccompanied trips could have been used to acquire a gun or plant a bomb. Some of the crew members also say that he was heard saying anti-Nazi jokes, leading some of the crew members to believe that he wanted to send Hitler a message by blowing up their most famous airship. Ultimately, Joseph Spa survived the disaster by jumping out a window and only suffered a broken ankle. But it wasn't until 30 years after the event in the late 1960s that this theory was thoroughly debunked when the FBI concluded that it found no evidence of sabotage. Another theory claims that there was a buildup of static electricity on the Hindenburg that caused the hydrogen to ignite the fabric making up the outer skin. In order to make up for the delay of more than 12 hours in its transatlantic flight, the Hindenburg passed through a weather front of high humidity and high electrical charge. Although the mooring lines were not wet when they first hit the ground, the ignition took place four minutes after. Some people theorized that they may have become wet in these four minutes. When the ropes, which were connected to the frame, became wet, they would have grounded the frame but not the skin. This would have caused a sudden potential difference between the skin and the frame, and the airship itself, with the overlying air masses, and would have set off an electrical spark. Seeking the quickest way to the ground, the spark would have jumped from the skin onto the metal framework, igniting the leaking hydrogen. The Hindenburg disaster shattered the public's faith in the Zeppelin industry. By 1939, only two years after the disaster, the Zeppelin industry had all but collapsed, with the final nail in the coffin being the outbreak of World War II, with all available resources going to the German Luftwaffe. As the 1950s dawned, jet airliners became standardized as the go-to way for air travel. However, even after the war, there were attempts to make passenger liners again, but these ultimately proved unsuccessful. 
with the last of the experimental airships being built in the mid-1960s.